My first take of 2024 is that Vinny Pasquantino is going to be an all-star. Why? Find out in this edition of Locked on Royals. You are Locked on Royals, your daily Kansas City Royals podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for tuning in to another edition of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. As always, I'm your host, Jack Johnson. You can follow me on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. We're also live on TikTok. We're live on Instagram. So go, go give us a follow over there at Locked underscore on underscore Royals. And find us on wherever you get your podcasts. That can be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts. Also, we are on YouTube. About 850 subscribers, which was nearly a 500 subscriber jump since we started this podcast, or at least since I took over as host of this podcast, going back to the end of June. So we've come a long, long way, but still a ways to go as we want to get to 1,000 by opening day 2024. Today's show is brought to you by Jace Medical. With a new year, make sure that you are covered when it comes to any disasters that may happen any accidents that may happen, Jace Medical is your friend, and they are a very proud sponsor of today's show on the Locked On Podcast Network. If you want to know a little bit more about me, you're a first-time listener. We always love it having new listeners here on the Locked On Royals channel. Well, I work in sports. I work here in Kansas City at Sports Radio 810 WHB. I got a show once a week over there. In fact, tomorrow night, I will be on 7 to 10 if you want to check me out on all things sports, not just Royals baseball. You can find me there and on ESPN Kansas City. I'm there Monday through Friday, 10 to 11. So stay pretty busy in the sports world, but you know, and you will always know that when you click on this podcast, you're going to be getting 30 straight minutes of Royals baseball. Now, again, for the first time listeners out there, I want to make sure that you're well informed. And that's that for the off season, probably till we get to spring training, we're going to have three podcast episodes a week. It's not always going to be consistent of a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Really just going to have to fit into my schedule as to when I can get these out, but glad for tonight I can get a Monday episode. Won't be having one tomorrow, but probably back on track Wednesday and Thursday before we get to the weekend. But when we're in season, it is five episodes a week, and that's what makes us unique here on the Locked On Podcast Network is that we give you podcasts every single day, whether they're recaps of games, hard-hitting stuff, interviews we want to keep you well informed and for the off season we're hoping that you've been enjoying this content over the past couple months or so for my first segment today i wanted to do a little bit of a look ahead uh and stick my neck out there you've heard me say that phrase a lot since taking over as podcast host and sticking my neck out there is fun for me uh, because it brings up talking points it allows fans and followers to Either join the bandwagon, believe what I say, or to criticize what I say. But that's kind of the fun of this all. And what I want to do in opening up this podcast is stick my neck out there because it's a player I believe in. And he's also a player that I'm willing to be wrong on as well. Like I have no issue being tagged on, you know, cold takes exposed. No issue with that if this doesn't end up being true. I just have been a huge believer in this guy ever since he got to Kansas City. In fact, ever since his first year in the minor league system. And that's Vinny Pasquantino. Now, turn up your volume on your headset, however you're listening. Maybe you're watching on YouTube. Turn it up a little bit. Record this if you want to so that I can be locked into this. No pun intended. But I can't get out of it. I I will be out there to the internet. This take will be truthful from my point of view. And if I'm wrong... Find every single way to make fun of it and expose me as being somebody that maybe is too much of a believer in this one guy. But my stance is this. Vinny Pasquantino is going to be an all-star in 2024. First of all, with this, I could understand some people listening going, really? That's the hot take? Uh, A guy that is projected to be really good this year? That's going to be an all-star? I mean, that's not that outlandish to say. And I could also rebuttal with that and saying, well, it's a guy that's never played a full season before. You know, and I'm gambling on the fact that he's healthy, which he's never shown in his big league career. He has dealt with shoulder injuries 
He's coming off shoulder surgery. He missed 100 games last year. I mean, how can a guy like that in a loaded American league become an all-star? And I'm also somebody that buys into projections. I also don't base it on everything. Like just because somebody has a good projection or a bad projection for that matter, doesn't mean I'm going to follow it to the end of the earth. I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket because of what fan graphs has to say, or what baseball savant or baseball reference has to say about this player. But Vinny Basquintino to me is somebody that I, I think I've said multiple times. I don't think I know I've said multiple times on this podcast. I think he's the best pure hitter on the team. I think going into this year, he is truly the guy in a run scoring opportunity I would want at the plate. There are going to be people that hear me say that and go, well, what about Bobby Witt Jr., Jack? I mean, he's going to get top five MVP votes. I agree with that sentiment. I think he's going to have an incredible year three in Kansas City. But in terms of the approach, in terms of the, I got a guy on third base, or I got a guy on second base, game on the line, need to drive in that run, I think I want Vinny at the plate. I think he is that guy that has the best overall approach. I think his eye is the best. I think he hits the ball incredibly hard. And when you change the launch angle just a bit, I'd say 20 to 25 home run type of guy. Fangraphs already projected him to have a 128 WRC plus. That would shatter everybody else's WRC plus on the team for 2023 and 2024 projections. In fact, I tweeted this out uh, back on Sunday, I think it was, so just yesterday, that 128, though it's a projection for 2024, 128 among first basemen in the American League last year would have been second behind only Yandy Diaz, who had the highest WRC plus of anybody uh, in the American League and National League among first basemen, higher than Freddie Freeman. But 128 is an absurd type of year. And so that brings me back to my point. I think it's a safer bet to make him the all-star representative for Kansas City if he's healthy. I think he's as safe as a pick as you can have, maybe next to Bobby Wood Jr., because I think now even if Bobby Wood Jr. struggles in the first half, he's going to be that that one pick. Like, if you got to send one guy, it's going to be Bobby Wood Jr. But if there's a second, I don't think there's anybody safer on the roster than Vinny Pasquantino. This isn't to say that he's going to start, right? I think that Vladdy Jr.'s got the upper hand. Uh, Vinny's also still got to show he can stay healthy and contribute. I just have no doubt in my mind that if he is healthy, he doesn't have a freak shoulder injury, he's going to contribute. His numbers translate to that. And that's what's so safe about this pick. I have had you know debates back and forth with people on Twitter, people on YouTube. Of, uh, there's one side that goes, I'm not going to put all this expectation on one guy who's never been healthy. And I completely agree with that. You would have to take both of his seasons at his big league career to really match up to about 162. I think it's a little bit over that. But the numbers supporting that are really impressive. His rookie season numbers, if he played maybe 20 more games, that's rookie of the year conversation. Uh, defensively, he's never going to be the gold glove first baseman. He's never going to be the lights out defender that some guys around the league are like, I don't think he's going to be a Freddie Freeman. I'm not going to say that he's going to be a, a 10-time All-Star or multiple-time Gold Glover or win MVPs. Not saying anything like that. I just believe deep down there's an All-Star. There's a multiple-time All-Star at that because offensively, I think there's such tremendous value that cannot be ignored. And really, the injuries, they do not concern me. I think the long-term effects of it, uh, they can be taken into account. Anytime you have shoulder surgery early on in your career, it's a nagging thing. I can I can understand that. But I think it's more so problematic when I'm looking at a pitcher. If a pitcher, first years of his career, he's got arm problems, shoulder problems, like that to me is an issue. Because what do you have to use all the time as a pitcher? Your arm. Not saying you don't have to use your arm as a hitter. But like the injuries for a hitter being a shoulder injury, I think it's kind of a freak thing. If you've got oblique problems all the time, if you've got uh, groin problems, lower leg problems, you know, something that's uh, contributing to your lower half, that could be a little bit concerning to me, but kind of was a freak injury last year uh, that it just happened that way. Don't envision that happening again. I think he's 100%. I think he's ready to go, and I'm willing to buy stock. But are you? Let me know in the comments below on YouTube or let me know on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. 
is Vinny Pasquantino an all-star for 2024? I absolutely think he is, and I'm willing to stick my neck out there for him. All right, before we move on, want to give a shout out to Locked On Sports today. It's here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. When we return, I'm going to give all the numbers on Kyle Isbell and why maybe he's not as bad as some people think. That's next on Locked On Royals. You are tuned into Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. You can give me a follow on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. You can also find us on wherever you download your podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts. We're also on Odyssey and we're on YouTube. Just be the next subscriber to our channel. Before we go any further, let's give a shout out to one of the title sponsors today in Jace Medical and want to make sure that we give the best possible you know, appreciation and exposure that these great sponsors have. So with Jace Medical, I know we come to sports to escape for some of the crazy realities that we have in our life, but can we talk for just a minute about preparing for the real life outside of the sports world? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin, right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. That absolutely is frightening and should be frightening to everybody. I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than if you have a family member or a loved one, a child, girlfriend, boyfriend, that's dealing with something and you don't have something to provide them with to help them get better, to make them feel better. And thankfully, we'll all be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics that treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, among others. This stuff can happen to any of us. I actually was just sick, pretty sick, uh, not too long ago. Had to change up my podcasting schedule and glad to be in good hands because of Jace Medical. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician and your medication will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use offer code locked on to get $20 off on your order. So go to jacemedical.com again and use offer code locked on to get $20 off on your order with Jace Medical. Now, back to the point at hand, back to this Royals roster, guys that you want to believe in, guys you want to buy stock in. I feel like I've got to be more transparent, and a little bit more open to answering questions about Kyle Isbell and give my reasoning as to why I made this sudden shift in him being the everyday center fielder for Kansas City. Last year, I would say around August, I had punted on the idea. I think I had seen just about enough of Kyle Isbell. Um, I did not think his bat would ever come around. But I don't think I was valuing the defense as much as I should. There is a very big difference, and I mean a huge difference, in the value of a center fielder who may be below average but pretty good offensively and a center fielder who is elite defensively but can't really hit. There is a massive gap in overall value. At least some advanced data would tell you that. And I think... It comes down to what your lineup looks like, what your overall structure looks like. The Royals, unfortunately, do not really have, I think, an outfield defense to live with a poor defensive center fielder or an offensive first center fielder. They have to build this lineup, I would say more so defensively, around a really good center fielder, right? If you're having MJ Melendez in left and Hunter Renfro in right, you want to make sure you've got somebody elite out there. That's what they thought when they brought in Michael A. Taylor. They wanted to stabilize center field. They wanted to make sure their pitchers felt like they had somebody that could track down a lot out there. And the good thing about having a really good defensive center fielder, and Kyle Isbell was top five in center fielders last year and about outs above average. Right, Brendan Doyle, I think, was number one for the Colorado Rockies. Michael A. Taylor, the year he won a gold glove, had 18 outs above average. That was best in baseball. That was best among outfielders. And we saw a little bit with Michael A. Taylor when the bat came around, when he hit his hot stretches, made him 
one of the more valuable guys on the team. And that's kind of where I'm at with Kyle Isbell. I think he's young enough to still buy stock in. Um, I'm not sure if that bat ever comes around. But I will tell you this with 100% confidence. If it just marginally comes around, that's a guy I think you could have not only this year in center field, but next year. And you can make it work with your outfield with just a very defensive first center fielder. The Diamondbacks did it last year with Alec Thomas. Alec Thomas was worse offensively than Kyle Isbell. Kyle Isbell actually had him beat defensively. So they would have been upgraded with Kyle Isbell out there in center field. And that's kind of, I think, the way a lot of teams look at the position now. You can luck out and get a superstar in center, and you want to be very well uh, represented in center field. You don't want just stop guys all the time. Eventually, for Royals fans, you want to hit on Lorenzo Kane, somebody that is a gold glover and can really hold his own in the lineup, can hit third for you. But Lorenzo Kane is also one of the best outfitters I think ever played for Kansas City. He was, I think, the best player on the 14 and 15 team. And that, I think, is why it's so hard for Kyle Isbell to fit in is because the expectation, or maybe the comparison, is always going to be number six. It's always going to be Lorenzo Cain. If you're not that type of player, well, let's move on. Now, Kyle Isbell is never going to be Lorenzo Cain. And I know some of you fans are not saying that. Some of you fans are saying, hey, he's not good offensively. I don't want that in center field. But my point at this is there's no rush, really. Because you know the defense Kyle Isbell provides. If the offense can come around just a little bit, and he's had a weird major league career. He was rushed to the bigs in 2021, I think it was, because of a really good spring training. Then he got hurt. 22, kind of the same thing. Got hurt again last year. Battle injuries. So durability, I think, is more so of a concern for me, even over the offensive struggles. Defense is going to be his main headliner. He is so good defensively, can be a gold glove finalist. But once that bat, if that bat comes around, now you're talking about a four war player, a four and a half war player. Maybe you value war, maybe you don't. That, though, would be league wide respected as a good center fielder. And I think JJ Piccolo envisions that. Maybe with more protection in the lineup, not having the immense weight of expectation to be a a center fielder all-star or center field all-star, I should say, maybe not having that pressure, just contributing at the bottom half of the order could be what Kyle Isbell needs. I mean, I think a a great example, not for center field, but for a player that kind of had the same criticism going into a year was Nicky Lopez before he hit 300, right? Alberto Mondesi was the shortstop. Everybody wanted him to be. He gets hurt right at the end of spring training. Nikki has to play short all year. What does Nikki do? Hits 300, OBP at 365, great defense. One of the best uh, overall war seasons we've seen from the Royals, you know, kind of in this last five to six year stretch. It wasn't for Bobby Wood Jr. I mean, you're looking at Nikki Lopez as one of the more valuable single season guys the Royals have had. Can you imagine if Kyle Lisbell kind of had that same trek of, hey, we're going into the year, you might be criticized, but I'm not saying Kyle Lisbell's going to hit 300. But what if he hits 250? OBP a 310, 315. No swipes 15 to 20 bags. You know, I think he can hit the ball hard when he's rolling. And I'm not even worried about the launch angle. I bring that up with Michael Garcia. I bring that up with Vinny Pasquantino. He can be a singles hitter and really good out there in center field. And you can have an overall valuable player. They've got a gold glover in center field. The bat does have to come around. I will say this, though. The leash can be... Short to medium short. We discussed that two weeks ago. I don't think you need to rush to get him out of there by April or May. But if he's not cutting it by June, maybe the defense isn't as valuable as we think. And he is the fourth outfitter that I once believed him to be going back to August. But I'm willing to give him a second chance. Are you? Let us know in the YouTube comments below or let me know on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. All right, before we wrap up the show, one guy I want to talk about. And he was somebody I I said is going to open the year on the bench. But let's take the opposite side. Let's play devil's advocate. I'm going to make a case for why Nick Lofton should be on the opening day roster and one step further should be starting on the opening day roster. That's next on Locked on Royals. You are tuning to Locked on Royals on the Locked on Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. Be sure to give me a follow on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. 
That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore one five. Before we go any further, let's give a shout out to the other title sponsor today in FanDuel. The NFL regular season has wrapped up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays, finding bets in the new Explore tab, making a parlay in the Parlay Hub, which is the best way to find popular parlays, and much, much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. The other guy I'm going to turn to today and, you know, kind of put some support behind him, and maybe he doesn't really need it because I know a lot of the followers, a lot of the listeners, like this guy over a certain individual who I have pegged to be the second baseman on opening day for Kansas City, of course, being Michael Massey. The other guy who's going to make a run at it is Nick Lofton. And I think Nick Lofton is the the good pick, the sexy pick for Royals fans because he was so good in September at the end of the year. My take on it was I didn't see enough in a big enough workload to just be the penciled in opening day starter. But here's where I'll change my tune a little bit. Here is where I might be a little bit more open-minded. I am totally all right. I am totally fine if Mac Quatrero, and we'll be down there in surprise from February 17th to the 21st, I believe it is. Want to make sure I get my dates right. We'll be bringing you live podcasts. We'll be out there on the field. We'll have player interviews. It's going to be a very fun couple of days in surprise. But if I get there and we are told, hey, second base is up for competition. Uh, we're going to have Michael Massey competing out there. We're going to have Nick Loft, and we'll have Samad Taylor, Garrett Hampson. It's open competition, open season. I'd be all right with it. I really would. Um, just because I think Michael Massey and Nick Lofton both know that spot is not guaranteed. Though my gut tells me the Royals want to give Michael Massey the edge, maybe they want the competitiveness in spring. They want to have two guys go head-to-head, two guys they like a lot, two young guys on the roster, and say, hey, you know, just because you don't get the job doesn't mean you're not going to be valuable to this team. No, I took the approach of, if you start Michael Massey opening day and let him work for it and it doesn't work out, hey, Nick Lofton's right there. No, I think that's kind of an easy transition, an easy switch. If you start Nick Lofton opening day and it doesn't work out, and then you turn to Michael Massey, well, Michael Massey's already been benched. Who knows how he takes that? I'm sure he's a, a very humble guy and somebody that would be all right to jump back into that spot, but it's a mental thing. Baseball's all about you know mental hurdles. However, I will say this. In terms of upside, in terms of potential, I think I would be foolish in saying that Nick Lofton is not the better prospect because Nick Lofton was also a first-round pick. You know, Michael Massey, I think, was fifth uh, coming out of Illinois, but Nick Lofton is a first-round pick here. I mean, he is somebody that can live up to first-round pick potential. I still think there's some parts of his game that have to get better for him to be an everyday player. But all I would say is this. The case for him is that he could roll into spring training, tear the cover off the ball, and that could win him the job. There is a very real-world scenario in which that happens. The other good thing that Nick Lawson has going for him over somebody like Michael Massey is that he can play anywhere. He played first base a little bit last year. He played third. He played second. He was a college shortstop at Baylor. He can play center field. He can play left. He can play right. He is a lesser version so far, so far. I just had to bring him up because we talked about him over the weekend. He's a lesser version of Whit Merrifield. You know, uh, Whit Merrifield was a later round pick, spent a longer time in the minor leagues, but what made him valuable, what allowed him to make a lot of rosters, what allowed him to play every day was that he could play anywhere. Michael Massey can't play anywhere. He's only played second base in Kansas City. And that can hinder you when you're trying to win over a spot. Nick Lofton is going to have a lot of upside going into spring training. And the case for him is that he's younger. Uh, Michael Massey has now had a year and a half to prove he is an everyday big leaguer. Last year was all about evaluation. And I've said this on the podcast before. It doesn't take you 200, 250 games to evaluate somebody. If you use an evaluation year and you lose 106, 
you have your answers for a lot of guys. I also do want to point out, though, while I'm making my point and a case for Nick Lofton, the lack of games is going to go against him. That is undeniable. And even though Michael Massey was not a great everyday player last year, he was there all season long. And the Royals in the past have shown that if somebody finishes the year strong in the second half, if you feel like there were a couple things they fixed, they want to see him get another chance, they're going to give the everyday player, the guy who has more games under his belt, the first chance. Just think last year, Hunter Dozier at third base. Instead of rushing somebody to play third base or bringing in somebody else, unfortunately, they went with Hunter Dozier. And then when Hunter Dozier proved he couldn't cut it for the third straight year, they moved on from him. I could see the other approach from my, or the same approach for Michael Massey of, all right, it's a year and a half. He's still young. He's slightly older than Nick Lofton. Let's see if it works out because the best case scenario, Michael Massey's the opening day starter. He thrives. Nick Lofton makes the team. He's playing every other position every other night. Uh, maybe he takes over for somebody completely and boom, there you go. Both guys are thriving. That's the best case scenario. I just think it is a, a, better chance than maybe I originally believed that the Royals show up to surprise next month and Matt Quatrero says that there's going to be some competition at multiple positions. There ain't going to be any competition at third, not at short, not at first, not behind the plate, not in center, not in right. They signed Hunter Renfro and I don't believe in left field, but second base is really the only spot. Uh, maybe you could throw MJ Melendez in the, I'm going to, Challenge him with somebody, challenge him with a Tyler Gentry, challenge him with a Samad Taylor. But I just think they feel MJ Melendez has more of a, a responsibility, a bigger role for this team than Michael Massey does. Michael Massey's got a spot he has to earn. I think he gets the job. But I will say, Nick Lofton's case is that I think the ceiling's a bit higher. I think the power's there. He was a first round pick, he could play anywhere. There's a lot of aspects to his game that make him an attractive selection for second base. And I know a lot of fans out there want it to be Nick Lofton, but hey, I guess we'll wait and see when we show up to Surprise Arizona next month. We're actually coming up on one month exactly from when pitchers and catchers report. Well, that is going to do it for another edition of Lockdown Royals and the Lockdown Podcast Network. I've been your host, Jack Johnson. Be sure to give me a follow on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. Before we go... One last shout-out to Locked On Sports Today. It's here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first-ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. We won't have a show tomorrow, but we'll have two more to close out the week, and we'll have plenty of more Royals baseball to discuss. And we are going to dive a little bit more into Matt Quatrero himself, what the expectation should be. And we've been using the term long and short leash last couple of weeks. Just how long will that leash be for Matt Quatrero in this Royals rebuild? We will dive into that in the next episode of Lockdown Royals. But until then, you take it easy, Kansas City.